Now, if I recall, how many of you, quite a few of you work with people with eating disorders, correct? Raise your hand. Okay. Well, then I'm not going to go and talk about, you know, the, the symptoms and all that kind of stuff. I wasn't sure who was going to be present today and what kind of my, what my speaking audience is going to be like. So I'm just going to kind of skip through that. But I'm going to buzz through these slides. I like visuals. So I'm going to buzz through these slides pretty quickly. Okay. And hopefully this will be a lively presentation for you. I have some YouTube clips I want to show. Um, one I'm hoping that will work <laughs> is when Brian um, was going to recovery and when he went on the Dr. Oz show. And I'll do that a little bit later, right before our interview. I'll talk to you a little bit about my story and, and uh, show you a little bit about that as well. Real men don't get eating disorders. You know, there's only about 10% of the people who have eating disorders that are diagnosed as male, so to speak. And that's highly underreported, as you know. Um, this is an organization, some statistics that I'll show you that I'm going to uh, go from. This is from ANAD, uh, National Association of Anorexia Nervosa and Associated Disorders in, in Illinois. How many of you have heard of that? Okay, a few. Okay. I, um, over, the number, over the years, they have been kind enough to allow me to speak on behalf of them as well and on a volunteer basis and just um, be available for different media and to be an advocate for men with eating disorders. So these are slides that I'm going to just skip over for the sake of time. Um, mainly what I want to focus on is men versus women. Like what are differences? You know, mainly uh, dealing with men though. Now for women, what I've learned in my experience, and a lot of you have a lot more experience working with people with eating disorders than I do, believe it or not, but um, I thought about thinness, you know? I want to be thin. Uh, with guys, it's I want to be ripped, right? With guys, it's a little bit different. Our brains are wired differently than females. And uh, we're much more visual, and we also like to have this cut look. Right? We want to be muscular, we want to be macho, we want to be um, athletic looking, we uh, aspire sometimes as little kids to be professional athletes or to be, uh, have a body like a professional athlete or a movie star or something like that. Now I'm not I'm stereotyping of course, it's not with all men. But this is common for the people that I've worked with eating disorders, is they, that's what they want to be like. They, they aspire, they want to have some kind of cut look, not just to be thin. As I already mentioned, 10 to 15 percent of the eating cases, eating disorder cases, are male, and that is highly underreported. Um, that is something I've learned over the years. Um, men less likely are to seek treatment due to it being a female illness. We're embarrassed. We feel ashamed, and that's a theme that has been mentioned a number of times today through the different presentations that you've been to. Um, there's a higher percentage in gay men. I don't know exactly why, but it is something that uh, th there has been a myth out there that, well, all gay men have an eating disorder. Well, that's not true, right? But there is a higher percentage in them. Doctors are less likely to diagnose EDs in males. And I think one of the reasons is because it's easier to hide, particularly with athletics. Well, I'm just in training, you know. Oh, I need to put in my miles. Oh, I, I, I had to lose weight for wrestling. Or, hey, as a swimmer, I have to be thin, you know, it, it, it'll improve my performance. It's easier for an athlete to hide an eating disorder because they can just blame it on their training. Um, men are less likely than women to be diagnosed earlier. Body image is attached to a sleek cut look, which we already talked about. We like that uh, the veins popping out of our arms and we like the, our muscles showing with that sleek cut look. <clears throat> Whereas women, a lot of times it's thinness. There's something about being thin that they aspire to, that attracts them. And for binge eating, for men, it provokes, it's less likely to provoke attention because, hey, we're guys, we eat a lot. Okay? Brian and I were joking through the last couple of days because I've been looking forward to, to the meals here. <laughs> Brian goes, what? So, how, what are you looking forward to tomorrow? And I go, breakfast. <laughs> So what are you, what are you going to be doing after the, oh, I'm going to be looking forward to lunch. I can't see what to no, we were just joking about that, but I have a good appetite. Ever since I've been a little kid, I've been a very healthy eater. Um, that was something that I've been endowed with with my mother. 
I mean, I was a three squares a day, meat and potatoes kind of guy growing up in Wisconsin. And uh, so it's easy for someone with an eating disorder, or for a male uh, who eats like that to high bow, I'm just a healthy eater. Oh my gosh, you ate three hamburgers? Yeah, I'm hungry, you know. But then they'll go in the bathroom and they throw it up. Or they'll go and they won't eat. They'll skip the next three meals and they'll go run 20 miles. You know, you know the media really sucks, to put it plainly. Um, this is something that I learned quickly as I went through um, my teenage years and aspiring to be an athlete, because I wanted to be a professional athlete. Baseball was my sport, and I played football and basketball as well. But I really looked up to the professional athletes of my day. Okay? I looked up to, I read Sports Illustrated, like probably one of the only things that I read growing up. I wasn't a big reader, believe it or not. I wasn't a, a school kid. I, I wasn't, um, you know, I was okay in school. I did my, I had good grades. I did my best, but you know, I didn't do as well as I could. Okay, I was so focused on my image. I was so focused on being the best, to be a professional athlete. So the media really influenced me, and that obviously, for those of you who work with eating disorders, that's pretty common. A little how is uh, broken off the screen there. Say, how many TVs did you have growing up? How many, you, how many of you sitting in this room um, have, when you were growing up as a teenager, had at least two TVs in your house? How many had three? Anybody have more than three? Very few. Okay. How many had one? <laughs> okay. That's pretty normal. I had one too. It was a color TV, but it was a big box thing on four legs, sat in the living room. When I asked this um, of the students uh, at my school, I teach this class called Life Skills class for freshmen. I have a whole freshman class throughout the year, and um, this is body image, one of the uh, topics that I talk about. And I asked them this question. When I ask them the question, you know, how many of you have at least two TVs in your home? How, how many hands think go up? All of them. <laughs> and then I say, three TVs, the hands stay up. Four TVs, the hands stay up. Maybe one or two might drop. Five TVs, so then more drop, but there's still maybe a quarter of them in the air yet. I say, how many of you have a TV in your room? At least half to three quarters have a TV in their room. That was unheard of for me. I go, how many of you have a cell phone? Well, of course, all the hands go up. Now I'm going to reveal something to you that's going to sound very strange. I do not own a cell phone, nor have I ever owned a cell phone. You're like, what? How do you, how do you communicate? What do you do? How do you live? Right? And uh, I will one day get a cell phone, <laughs> okay? But it's not that I'm afraid of having it. I purposely have chosen not to get a cell phone. Does anybody know why? Yes. Being that I can look, I don't know if the, I could use the term addictive personality, but I know if I get a cell phone, that thing is, I'm going to be very, very tempted to let that control my life and how I communicate with people. Because when I was going through my treatment with eating disorders, I love to isolate myself, okay? I love to communicate um, with people by letter or sending messages with people or just hiding out in my room, right? And one of the things that I had to learn to do going through treatment is I need to get myself out there. I need to socialize more. Here, you need to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. Don't just call them on the phone, <laughs> you know what I mean? You need to go to them face to face. That was very difficult for me. Standing up here for you today, I can't, I can't tell you how, that would have been a miracle for me to do that when I was a teenager. I was very shy, very socially sensitive. I was so concerned about what you were thinking of me, if you would like me or didn't like me and so on and so forth. And part of my therapy was I need to get out and go and hang out with friends, go to a basketball game, you know. Go to a party. Could there be alcohol there? I was this kid that's like, well, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to have anybody see me around with troublemakers around school. I was this nice goody two-shoes kind of kid. 
So I am highly influenced by the media. I don't watch the news on television. I don't read the newspaper. I don't go on the internet and follow um, what's going on in the national news. Every now and then I do. But I've learned in our society, I can figure out what's going on in my world by just talking to somebody else. Because somebody will know. Because <laughs> everybody else is so uncut. Now, it's not like I'm isolating myself in my world. What I'm saying is I've learned that I can easily become so attracted and so um, obsessive and compulsive with just knowing all this information and, and, and especially being uh, influenced by the media and how people look and, and what people's body types are like and so on. So I just chosen to like, you know what, I'm going to keep my life simple. Which has been very difficult. Because um, when I say to people, you know, I don't have a cell phone, and they look at me like, what? How do you, how do you function? I do, I'm here today. Okay? Um, so there's a way around that. And I feel good about that. That, you know, I'm not letting it control me. But I am, my wife and I, um, I have two teenage daughters and a 10-year-old son, who, by the way, don't have cell phones either. And you're like, really? Your teenage daughters don't have cell phones? They're always borrowing somebody else's cell phone. But they had no interest in it. They don't care to, you know, they see, they see the destruction sometimes, what happens with Facebook, the bullying that goes on, the, particularly with girls. And they're, I don't have nothing to do with that. So I'm proud of them for that. But, you know, they use it. And when my daughter eventually goes to college next year, or actually a couple years from now, um, we're going to get cell phones. I want to stay in contact with her, otherwise I'm never going to be able to talk with her. There continues to be more TVs per home than people. 2.86 TVs to 2.59 per people, or people per home. According to the AC Nielsen Company, the average American watches more than four hours of TV each day, or 21 hours a week or two months of non-stop TV watching per year. So in a 65-year life, that person will have spent nine years glued to the tube. Nine years. That is a lot. 30,000, what does that number represent? Anybody know? Not ours. Actually, it's 30,000 ads or commercials that the average person will see a year. Whether it's on a billboard, whether it's on their cell phone, whether it's uh, they go to an internet site and all those ads are popping up on the side to pay for that particular uh, item to be average or that uh, particular site to be online. Um, television is still the number one media. Um, written, um, what else do I say? Newspapers, magazines, and so on. Thirty thousand. So when you're exposed to that much, right, and you're exposed to people that look like that, or like that, over and over, as a guy, as my, and I'm speaking for myself now, I can't speak for all guys, but when I'm exposed to that kind of media, like that's how I need to look to be happy, successful, be attracted to girls, you know, that is who to aspire to be, and that's very difficult for me. So I, I you know, I, I like it, I just really picky about how I choose my media. Okay, I'm going to show this little clip here. Let's see if it'll pop up right here. Otherwise, I'm going to do it the way that Libby told me. Hey, it's going to work. Beautiful. Now, Hold on a second. Where's the, uh, where is the, on this laptop, where is the microphone? Is it at the top? I'm put this on it, right there. Counterparts, however, 
Most boys aren't out to get thin. No, they want to be cut. At the chiseled physique of Bond actor Daniel Craig, or the ripped athleticism of soccer star David Beckham. But those celebrities and athletes devote their lives to achieving their physiques. Some kids instead take potentially dangerous shortcuts. A recent study found that more than 10% of our sons are supplementing their diets with shakes, powders, and pills, promising six-pack abs, rock-hard chests, and bulging biceps. Would you like to build a better body? Well, now you can. Get your sexy out. Get your sexy out. Muscle up. Pump iron. Get ripped. Detox. You'll see amazing results in weeks, maybe even days. Imagine this hype playing on the impressionable minds of hormonal self-conscious teenagers determined to transform their bodies into something more appealing to girls or more intimidating on the football, lacrosse, or baseball field. Now you can have fervor, tighter, stronger, toned abs. The problem is often overlooked. While girls tend to send up warning signs with their I'm too fat comments or erratic eating habits, our boys are much more subtle. They tend to eat normally and supplement in secret. And that's downright scary because the long-term effects of these supplements are largely unknown. Protein powders and shakes are the most popular among boys, but they also reach for creatine, amino acids, growth hormone, and the most dangerous, anabolic steroids. While the overall safety of supplements is still a question, the effectiveness of the ads you guys hear it at all? is not. A study done for Children's Hospital in Boston found that boys who read fitness magazines are twice as likely as their peers to try these products. Those looking to gain weight were three times more likely than their peers to use supplements weekly. And weightlifting and football were the sports most closely linked to supplement use. Whether the use was self-driven, peer-driven, or coach-driven is unknown. Not all boys set out to bulk up. Some, like girls, just want that wiry Mick Jagger look. Trouble is, they end up taking it too far. The American Journal of Psychiatry estimates that one million American men now suffer from either anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating. And while it's still a taboo topic, for example, the number of boys affected isn't even known, some famous faces are stepping forward with their stories. If you want to make a fight for these boys, why not get it over with? In a March 2007 interview with Best Life magazine, actor Dennis Quaid acknowledged his manorexia and said it began in 1994 when he had to drop 40 pounds to play Doc Holliday in the film Wyatt Earp. He ate less than 600 calories a day and weighed only 130 pounds when shooting began. Quaid sought professional help. This a girl that was perfect last time. Do the same thing. Lean in. Just get on base. In 1998, Billy Bob Thornton told the Los Angeles Daily News that he, quote, got anorexic, unquote, and lost 59 pounds. At the time, he denied his problem to everyone, even his girlfriend. For Elton John, the problem was bulimia. He entered a treatment facility and recovered back in 1990. Overall, the numbers are startling. Harvard researchers released a report in February 2007 that found a surprisingly high rate of anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating in men. In fact, the report says that 25% of all anorexics and bulimics are men, as are 40% of all binge eaters. Many sufferers point to the media as part of the problem. The intensity of the image bombardment isn't quite as bad for boys and men as it is for girls and women. But the message is the same. Thin is in. This is how you should look. If you look this way, your life will be great. If you suspect a problem in your house, there are some concrete steps to take. Watch for the signs. Sudden weight loss is the most obvious. A dramatic change in eating habits warrants a quick call to the pediatrician. Be on the lookout for increased workouts and or sudden muscle development which could be a sign of supplement use. Compare real men to sports and movie stars. Point out that those who are ripped have teams of trainers, dietitians, and in some cases, surgeons. Ask about their friends. Sometimes it's easier for boys to talk about others rather than themselves. You might find out about your own son's behavior 
by asking him what other kids are doing to get in shape. Are they using steroids, working out incessantly, purging? Boys can be just as susceptible to body issues as girls, although any issues that surface tend to do so on average a few years later. As with girls, however, the best advice is to stress health over appearance at home. And if you suspect a problem, seek professional help immediately. We've got much more information on our website. at commonsense.com. Online and on demand. I'm Jim Steyer. Okay. All right. Sorry for the technical difficulties. <clears throat> the voice. Right. In my book, Skinny Boy, which I have on sale here too. I'm going to be signing copies of it after. But um, all of us know what that voice is in the back of our head. Some people call it your conscience. Some people call it their eating disorder. Some people call it uh, an unhealthy voice. Some people call it. Uh, some kind of harmful beast or demon. But we have this voice in the back of our head. And for me, it was my eating disorder voice. And in my book, I have, uh, there's me, and then there's it, which I created um, a character for my eating disorder, which is it, like a real living, breathing person. And then there's a voice called you, which is, after I got into therapy and treatment for my anorexia, that was the voice of healing for me. So here I was, I was between the voice of it and I was between, or, and the voice of you. And that's what I struggled with. I went back and forth and back and forth. And people with eating disorders can identify with that. Um, but that was the voice in my head. What message do you hear? Dr. Phil, I think this is kind of humorous. You're fat, don't try to sugarcoat it because you'll eat that too. <laughs> Gary, you got so much potential. This is a word that I absolutely despised growing up. Okay? Gary, you're so, oh, you got a chance to be a professional athlete. Gary, you got such a wonderful family. Now, your parents are so nice. They're so helpful. you got such a great sister and great brothers. You guys get along. We were like the perfect family. You know? We weren't rich or anything like that. But we weren't poor. My, parent, my dad worked the same job for 44 years. Okay? Very stable family. But I was the one in the family that was, I don't know, had the most potential. And I hated that. I hated that word potential. I'd smile, of course, on the outside and say, oh, thank you, and oh, yeah, cool. You know, or I'd shy away from that, but inside I hated that word. Well, why do you think I hated that word? Pressure, Pressure of course. It's pretty typical with a person with an eating disorder. They don't like that word. I mean, you have to live up to it. And I didn't feel I could live up to it. I didn't have the confidence. You can leave all that tail up, get thrown out the window. I had coaches tell me that. You know, once I, I started my eating disorder, and I'll get into it a little bit uh, soon, a little bit more detail. When I was about a uh, freshman in high school, my later freshman years in high school. And as a freshman, I was on the varsity baseball team. I was on the varsity basketball team. I, was on the, I wasn't on the varsity football team, but I was quarterback of uh, um, the... Um, freshman football team, and I was from some small little town in Eden, Wisconsin, uh, with a grand total of maybe 300 people, okay? So I'm from a real small town, rural Wisconsin. So I went to this high school, what I thought was big, which had a, probably about 120 people in my class. You know, that was big for me, right? Uh, that's nothing compared to some high schools today. But here I am. You know, everybody has these high expectations, high hopes of me because they've heard about me and how I played baseball and sports. And now I'm a freshman and like, I didn't even have to hardly try out for these sports. I just was, okay, Gary's going to be third baseman. You know, I'm like, well, don't I try out like with everybody else? No, you're just going to be, you know, we know you're good. We've seen you before. Well, that was a lot of pressure for me. I hated that. And then as I eventually went downhill my freshman year with my athletic performance, and people started to, like, what's going on with Gary? And I'll get into that in a little bit. Another message, you don't think or act or look like everybody else, so something must be wrong with you. 
that look that that person in the driver's seat is looking is looking at that passenger. That's a look that I absolutely that was like death to me. If it came from my parents, okay. All right, I saw that look from my mom <laughs> a few times in my life, and for me, that was just the most disappointing look that I could ever see. Okay? Very difficult to see. I thought this was kind of humorous. An advertisement in the, you know, tired of being fat and ugly? Well, how about just be ugly? <laughs> <coughs> you know, take care of your being fat, but weird. I feel fat, therefore I am fat. This is so common with people with eating disorders, particularly with the anorexia. I, I always, I would eat a sandwich and I would feel fat, you know? I'd try to stick out my gut like this, you know, like, oh, look at this. And I hated that feeling of being satisfied. I wasn't full. I told everybody I was stuffed, but I really wasn't. I lied. I was just satisfied because I hated that feeling of that food in my stomach. And I wasn't fat, obviously. I was very thin. But I felt fat. So therefore, I am. So however I felt, that's who I was. So that was another distorted message that I had. You have to look just right to feel good, and be confident and successful. Um, you see, less fat is a mark of dis a disciplined, successful man. I would see advertisements like that all the time. Huh, I mean, I'm kind of like this. I look kind of like that, you know, as I became an adult. Well, so I must look like that? I mean, is there something wrong with this? That's the message that I got. Um, those of you who work with eating disorders, you know that people who have eating disorders have a lot of black and white thinking. Right? You either have to be the best or you're nothing. Being very good is unacceptable. Being mediocre at something is very unacceptable. Just doing your best, is, that's just a term, that's, a, that's a, um, some words I never, that's nothing, that means somebody's failed already, just doing your best, you don't have to be the best. They have this black and white thing. So if this, this is if this, something if 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 I wanted to be like this, and I wanted to say to myself, you know, that's okay to have a body to look like that. Doesn't mean this guy's out of shape, okay? But that's the message that I got from the media. Yeah, he is out of shape. Wow, you lose ten pounds, way to go. You'll feel even better if you lose ten more. Right? There's always ten more. Always ten more pounds. Being sexy, thin, and fit is what women, women really want. I mean, that's a message that's plastered all over the media. No pain, no gain. How many times have we heard that? I hated when I saw people who, like when I ate and I, I told you that I felt full, this is how I felt that I looked like. Right? And I just, I felt people who had um, a situation where they were obese or they struggled with an, um, maybe obsessive, uh, 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 obsessive eating or compulsive overeating, I thought, well, they're so out of control. That's never going to be me. I'm in control. I can deny myself that cake right now that everybody else is eating. Everyone else is like, oh, I love this cake. Yeah. But no, I could, I could deny myself that. I took pride in that. But that pride also held me strong to my eating disorder. I thought this was cute. Work hard, stay thin, it's the only way to win. Right? Hunger equaled success with me. Very common. People with eating disorders. When I could see my bones and my ribs, that was success. I fulfilled my mission. Now I had to do better. Right? Um, someone like this, lazy slob. Right? That's not the case. That was judging them unfairly. But for me, black or white thinking, that's how I thought. Because I've been exposed to so much in the media, after a while I thought, well, people who have a body like this, well, they're just not in control of their lives, and you know, they're, they probably have a mess at home. And I'd have all these unrealistic um, visions in my head about what they must be like. They were lies. Instead of just really looking at, you know, this is a stereotype, okay? Yeah. Maybe you could eat healthier. It doesn't, it's not fair for me to judge this person. Right? But you can't get this thin. I would see uh, cases like this and it's like, well, I can get thinner than that. 
It was like a competition to me, just like sports was when I grew up. Okay, I'm going to go into my story just a little bit. I'm going to start it over. I'm just going to get it up on the big. Uh, Okay, I'm going to start it over. Have you ever heard of eating disorders? These are getting a real life lesson on eating disorders. I got down 102 and three quarter pounds. From 165 pounds, skinny, but not skinny enough, Gary Grawl tells these kids. When he was a high school anorexic, his goal was to weigh just 90 pounds. I was hospitalized six times for this. I almost died from it. Gary's struggle began during high school in the small Fond du Lac County town of Eden. I was pretty much your typical all-American boy. I was uh, pressured to perform a lot, to achieve, to be good enough. Um, and eventually, um, I needed some kind of control in my life because I couldn't control what people thought of me or um, how well I did in sports. Um, I could try, but I... I felt that I was, you know, never good enough. So, um, anorexia crept into my life. Counting calories, obsessively exercising, he lost 60 pounds in two years. Doctors tell Gary his eating disorder stunted his growth, but his routines continued into college. Anorexia had a grip on Gary. It was a very dark time, uh, but through a lot of hard work, um, you know, therapy, a lot of encouragement, uh, eventually I, I recovered. After recovery, Gary became a volunteer for a National Eating Disorder Association. And after grad school, he settled in Sturgeon Bay with his family. Okay, I'm going to say B. I'm going to say B too. He's been a professional counselor for 11 years. How does your experience help you help others now? I believe I can empathize with them a lot more. And I believe it helps build my trust with the people that I talk with who have eating disorders because once they know that I've been through that, it means a lot to them that, oh, yeah, you know what I've been through. Gary's willingness to talk about tackling manorexia has captured interest from magazines, newspapers, and national TV. Most recently, The Early Show on CBS. I grew up an athlete in a small town in Wisconsin. Gary splashed back into the spotlight after writing this book, Skinny Boy. When I was even going through therapy, I tried to look for books on males with eating disorders. There was none. The author says his book is the only first-person account about a male with an eating disorder. There's not a lot of men who come out and speak about their stories, so I wanted to encourage them, say, it's okay. It's okay to tell your story, to talk about your feelings, to, to share your struggle with people. And you don't necessarily have to write a book, but it's okay to talk and get help. Through his book, public speaking, and counseling, Gary feels his life has come full circle. He hopes he can empower others to avoid or overcome this life and death battle. What's the biggest message that comes out of, out of that book? Change is hard. Uh, but it's possible. Okay. okay. This picture here, back in um, 1985, right? As you saw, I grew up an athlete, and I'm a small town, want to be a professional athlete. Well, sophomore year, something started to happen, I started losing a lot of weight. When I was in eighth grade, I should back up a little bit, when I was in eighth grade, I weighed probably about 155, 160 pounds, okay? And I was five foot seven, between, well, five foot seven and a half, five foot eight, somewhere around there. Well, Today, like I like to tell, like I like to tell kids, I'm still pretty much the same size. I've gained some weight. I'm about 170 pounds now, and this is where I like to be. This is my healthy weight, but I really haven't grown much, and that was mainly because 
my psychiatrist and my physician say, I studied my growth. I was going through a growth spurt during my high school years, but I starved myself so much. My lowest weight was 102 and three quarter pounds. So for me, that was really, really thin. And I don't have pictures of myself back then because my parents refused to take pictures. Um, they didn't want to have anything to do. They don't want people to know about this. They hid this. Finally, eventually, my, uh, uh, my junior year in high school, um, I was hospitalized for the first time. Because my mom heard about, she was doing the dishes, and on the radio, which she was listening to, there was an advertisement at our local general hospital about an eating disorder um, treatment um, program that they had. It was just a general hospital, not specifically for eating disorders. She's like, well, that fits Gary. He's dieting, he's exercising like crazy, he's losing all this weight, he's obsessive compulsive, yeah, I know. On and on and on and on. So they got me an assessment, and of course, I'm a people pleaser. Okay, I'll go. Sure, no problem, Mom. I'll go. So I sat there, and immediately they diagnosed me, and a couple days later, I was hospitalized. Well, that was when I was 16 years old. And then I continued until I was 21 years old, in and out of the hospital, six different times. Um, my highest stay was 102 days. That was for one hospitalization. I was pretty much there for the entire summer. So overall, throughout my hospitalizations, I've been in and out for over, for over 300 days. So there's a lot of therapy that I went through. And Brian and I were talking about this before. I needed that, though. For some people who have eating disorders, they feel like they're defective in some way, you know? There's something wrong with them for struggling with it in the first place. And that uh, they should just get over it like that. But obviously we all know it's not that easy. And it's not going to be that way. You're in it for the long haul. And I did not want to accept that. Neither did my parents want to accept that. As Brad was talking about his family, you know, his dad was a pastor, mom was a stay-at-home mom. My dad wasn't a pastor, but my mom was a stay-at-home mom. I had uh, an older brother, an older sister, and a younger brother. The perfect family. We were athletic. We were involved in our community. We um, helped out other people. My dad was a stellar um, volunteer in our community. He was a hard worker, gritty hard worker, determined, um, strong German background. Right? But we hid depression. Right? I struggled with OCD. Um, I was suicidal at times. I did self-injury. I cut myself. I burned myself. I did all sorts of things that were very unhealthy for me. Right? But I hid it all from my parents. One day I came home from work. I worked at a nice fishing tackle equipment company when I was in high school. And uh, I worked with um, molted lead depth finders. Depth finders for ice fishing, so it you know, takes your lure to the bottom to see how deep the water is. Well, I molded those. And the temperature of that melting pot was like, in order for lead to melt, it was over 600 degrees. Well, one day, everyone else went out for lunch, and I was feeling particularly uh, not very good at that time. I went to start burning my arm. Came home. The next day, of course, they turned into all these blisters, and I kept them covered with my arms. And all of a sudden I was reaching for some potatoes or something and I went like this just to stretch my sweatshirt and I'm like, oh! I went down my mom looked at me. It's like, where did that come from? And of course I lied. <laughs> oh, mom, I was uh, working at the depth find, you know, molding lures and everything like that. Some, I was reaching under the table to get something and then all these, um, these scrap, the scrap, uh, uh, the scrap metal fell on my arm. Oh, okay. Okay. She believed it. Now this is weird. It wasn't until I wrote my book, okay, because I talk about this in my book. When my mom read my manuscript, um, she didn't realize, I had never told her that. And then when she read my manuscript, this was back in like 2002 or something like that, it was shortly after 9-11. She read that manuscript because I wanted to get her blessing on it too, because I talk a lot about my family. And she's like, did you actually have, did you, you mean you lied to me? And I'm like, didn't I tell you that before? She goes, no. I'm like, oop. <laughs> that was the first time my mom realized that I actually did that to myself. And she was just, you know. So I had hid it all those years. Okay? 
And there's a lot of things that I hid from my parents that they just were happy to not really deal with. Okay? My parents loved me, but we didn't talk about feelings, we didn't talk about, you know, world issues, we especially didn't talk about politics or religion. Right? So that was my life, in and out of hospitals growing up. Um, helpful tips. What I'm going to go through next, um, before Brian comes up here, really quickly, is some things that were really helpful for me. Um, that hopefully you guys, some of this might be review, but hopefully there are some things that may be able to take back with you to help out in your own practices. The battle within. Of course it's a battle within. It's not just about food, it's not just about weight. We all know that. But something has to be different. And change is hard. And we all know that. I had to accept that change needed to happen. I didn't want to accept change. <laughs> I liked everything systematic, predictable, neat, orderly. I didn't like to just fly by the seat of my pants. And that, when I went through therapy, I had to learn to fly by the seat of my pants sometimes. I had to learn not to be so serious. I remember in group therapy a number of times, they would give me bubbles. Gary, here's a little, but this is for little kids, you know. No, just blow bubbles. I'm like, why am I going to just blow bubbles in therapy right now? What's the purpose of that? Just blow it. Just see how it feels. And I blow bubbles and, I'm, and they go, how did it feel? I go, kind of stupid. <laughs> no, how did it feel? Stupid's not a feeling. And then they challenged me to get at feeling words, which I did not want to deal with. So I had to learn to, no, Gary, you had to deal with that kind of change. You have to accept that something's going to have to be different. I had to challenge my thought life, right? I had to start, start thinking differently and stop uh, focusing on my obsessive compulsive thoughts like I was stupid, I was dumb, I wasn't good enough, um, I was going to fail. I had to live my life with purpose. I had to find a purpose, you know? I was just kind of going through life, floating through life, doing what I thought everybody else wanted me to do, instead of looking at, like, what do you really want, Gary? What do you believe? That I always felt that I had to do things that other people wanted me to do. I remember the first time when I met my, well, she's my wife now, I've been married for 18 years, and when we were dating, I grew up Catholic, okay, which I didn't like, but I never said anything. I just went to church, went to Mass, did all, I was an altar boy, did everything I was told to do, but inside I was confused. And all of a sudden I met my wife, and I started going to her church, and it wasn't Mass. And... One morning I woke up, um, getting ready for church, and I decided, you know what, I'm not going to church, I'm not going to go to Mass today. I'm going to go with my, my girlfriend, Gina. And my wife, are you getting ready for Mass? No, I'm not going to Mass today. What? You're not going to Mass? No, I'm going to go with Gina. What? You're not going? And we had a big, strong fight on that. And that continued, and all of a sudden they started to hate my girlfriend, because she was taking their precious little boy away. All right? But that was the first time in my life, and this was after I'd been through my therapy, that was the first time in my life where I actually said no to my mother. <laughs> no, I'm going to do something for me that I believe. You know, I have some questions about this Catholic stuff that I just haven't gotten answered. I've been to CCD, Mom, and all that stuff, but I need to really explore what I feel, what I believe spiritually. And she was floored. She was mad at Gina. She was mad at me. Um, it was actually the first time that I can remember my mom actually getting mad, <laughs> outwardly. Otherwise, everything was fine, you know. So that was difficult. So I had to find a purpose, something that meant something to me. I had to learn that I can't force anybody to change, right? Um, sometimes as therapists, when I was a young therapist, I should say, um, how often I can think of all the times that I've wanted my clients to be what I thought they should be, you know? I wanted them to change because that would make me feel better, that I'm being successful as a therapist. And that was hard for me, that counter-transference stuff. And I learned going through uh, therapy as a, with an eating disorder that I couldn't force change. I needed those six hospitalizations. There was nothing wrong with me. I just needed six hospitalizations to have the, the much-needed therapy and counseling 
in, in psychodrama, in individual psychotherapy, in group therapy, in medication therapy, in art therapy, in music therapy, in all these different therapies. At first, like I was Brian, I was kicking, screaming. I thought it was so stupid and dumb. But after a while, I relaxed and learned, wow, this is, this is helping me. And I accepted it. You have to really want it, right? And I really wanted it. I had to prepare for my battle, all right? When I went through therapy, they said, Gary, this is not going to be easy. It's going to be painful. You're going to have to actually work. <laughs> you know, we're going to bring your parents in here for family therapy. And I'm like, what? What? No. And then the first time you remember when I had family therapy, everybody was just kind of sitting like this, talking about work, talking about sports talking about, oh yeah, what was on TV last night, and I'm sitting there quiet, you know, and the therapist was there just kind of waiting. <laughs> and eventually, we started talking about how things were, and it was, it's like, it was like cutting metal with the scissors to get my family to open up about anything, all right? It was very uncomfortable. So I had to learn that, you know what, this is going to be hard for you, Gary, but that's okay. Um, except that it's going to feel uncomfortable. Focus on facts and not feelings. You know, I get so wrapped up on my feelings, like, well, if I feel good, then I am good. You know, that's not the case. I have to also look at, you know, I've been blessed with a brain too. I need to use that as well. Study and see, figure out what worked for others. Um, I had certain people that I admired. I read a lot of books on eating disorders and therapy and treatment, all that kind of stuff. And I started to practice what they preached. And the more I did, the more I started to learn about what I wanted and how I needed to heal. <laughs> I like this picture. Pride. It was probably the biggest, I, for me, it's the biggest barrier in letting go of my eating disorder. Pride. I felt pride in it. I felt uh, good about what I was accomplishing, whether it was losing weight or whether it was getting attention. Um, I felt pride. And that's something that I needed to give up. I need to start asking honest questions as if, what would you do or what would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? I love that question. So if you take all that fear of what people would think of you, just throw it out of the picture. What would you do? And I like that uh, question. I love to journal about that question. I need to learn how to trust myself. OK. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to bypass all this stuff. Basically, um, in just a minute, I'll just kind of focus, not focus, but I'll just mention to you what this is. These are United States Navy SEALs. And when I was younger, um, I really started to study them. Somewhere to be the best, you know. However, my nephew works with the SEALs, and he would come home on leave, and I started to learn about their training habits. And one of the things, not only was I impressed, but I learned that that fit my mode of, of recovery. Um, for instance, oh, some of these are off. Um, sorry about that. This is a different laptop, so. In order to get to the training that they do, right, not only do they have to be physically in shape, but it's all mental. Right? The only people that make it through that kind of training is um, someone with an incredible amount of drive, stubbornness, okay? willing to accept a lot of pain, willing to accept that you know, I'm not going to quit. I like that mantra because it was something that I believed that I needed to do with my therapy. Right? I needed to use my obsessive compulsive determination, you know, just dogged, tough, you know, um, stubbornness. I needed to use that to my advantage and not hurting myself. Right? And that's when I went through therapy, I learned that that's something that I could do that was okay. Right? It wasn't a bad thing. I was using it in a poor way to harm myself. But then I started to realize, you know, why don't I use that for good? And one of the things was I started writing my book. And I don't know if you've ever, any of you have tried to attempt to write a book. It's incredibly hard. <laughs> it's a long 
process with a lot of rejection and a lot of time and you just don't know if it'll ever get published and it goes on for years and I wanted to give up but I eventually got it published. I wanted to complete my task. I was obsessed with getting it, <laughs> getting it published. And so that was a way that I like to tell students that, you know, it was a way to use something that I used to harm myself for good. All right? I'm going to move on with this. Okay. Um, this is my daughter. 12 years old. Well, she was 12 years old at the time. And I live in Door County, which is a um, tourist area. And we like to go to this place called Cave Point. And my daughters one day said, Gary, our dad, not Gary, dad, <laughs> we went to Cave Point the other day and we jumped off the cliff. Now, it's hard to see in this picture. That's about 25 feet in the air, okay? And it's a cliff that goes into the water. Now, not only is that water shallow right around in these areas, okay, there's only a small little spot here, probably about 10 feet in diameter where you can jump, and it's only about four feet deep, okay? Everywhere else is rock. And all of a sudden, one of my daughters came home, my oldest daughter, Abby, she's 17, she's, yeah, we were out there, we jumped in off the, and I go, yeah, really, I didn't really, and then they showed video of what they did, I'm like, you did that? And, yeah, you should come and try. I said, okay. Now, me being Mr. Logical and Sensitive and Perfection, you know, and Mr. Safety and Mr., I'm like, no, I'm going to try it once. Just do something spontaneously fun, just like blowing bubbles, you know. Just try it. So I did. I went there. I got to the edge. There was 25 feet, and I had I, there was a small little target of area where I had to jump. There was only four feet of water. Okay, it's like 25 feet in the air off a cliff, and all these tourists are around. Like, what are these idiots doing? Jumping into this water? It's like, and it's it's cold, and it's it, that's dangerous. And then my 12-year-old, okay, Dad, here I go. Down she goes. <laughs> and then my other daughter went who is in the water right there, and then I took a leap. Okay? I said, you know what, just do it. Just try it. When I went through therapy, I had to learn to just do it. Sometimes our clients just overanalyze things to death, you know? Drives you nuts, doesn't it? I mean, just, you know, just do it. Try it. Experiment. You know, See what the consequences are be and live with them. I needed to learn to public speak. Gary, yeah, just try to, I don't want to speak about my eating disorder. That's what, no, just try it and see what it's like. <sighs> okay, I can do it. I can do it. I psyched myself into it. And now, look where I am today. You know, I don't do this professionally, but I enjoy doing it as a service to give back for what I've learned and what I've grown from. Okay, I like this quote too from Steve Jobs. Almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things will just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Before I start with Brian, what do you feel is important? What's most important to you? And that's a question that uh, I would encourage you to talk about with your clients as well and your patients. What's most important to you? What's going to drive you? What's going to make you jump off a cliff like that? Take a risk. All right? And sometimes, I don't know. Well, then you can explore that through different means. Okay. Um, Brian, come on up. Now, I was going to play this I was going to play this clip that Brian, when he went through treatment, whoops, <laughs> when he went through treatment at Rosewood, but it's not on here. And so what I'm going to do, I had it right here, it come up. What I'm going to do, Brian, is I want you to tell a little bit about Nick, what you went through, a little bit about your story, and then what Brian and I want to do in interview form is compare um, what it was like for him to go through therapy compared to what it was like for me to go through therapy. You know, some things that we each learned. And then uh, with the last um, remaining minutes, then we will take questions. So why don't you go ahead and start. All right, can you hear me? 
Hi, uh, my name is Brian Bixler. Um, I'm an alumni with Rosewood. Um, my, a big part of my story is, I mean, we, we all talk about treatment here and, you know, treatment process and different techniques and I had a tr difficulty getting into treatment. Um, I spent about eight years trying to get help. Um, went to court twice. I lost both court battles um, as I got sicker and sicker over the years. And eventually I did get help through the Dr. Oz show. And I think that's the clip that they were going to show here today. Um, if you guys Google my name, you can see my whole story. There's like four pages of Google. Um, but anyway, I got severely ill. Um, I was about 75 pounds when I went into treatment. And it was a very difficult process. Um, when I first got there, I, you know, they, they, I, I said this on television, I said, you know, it has to get worse before it gets better, and that was really true for me. Because my first couple weeks, um, I had to get blood transfusion. Um, they had to send me down to Wickenburg Hospital. Um, I had severe edema for almost eight months, and it was an extremely slow, rigorous process, um, which, um, one of the things we talk about as far as recovery is how much you want it, and I wanted it so bad. I had spent about 10, 15 years in denial about having, having a problem at all. Um, we're kind of short on time, so I can't really get into my story, but I was an athlete. Um, I was a perfectionist, and that's probably where most of my disease started was perfectionism, which we talk, you talked about fueling that stubbornness. Um, I was, when I, when I focused on something, I could achieve it. And I was the top of my class in high school. I was number one in my university class in my bio department. Um, so whenever I went after something, I, I got it. And when I started to apply that to nutrition, I, you know, was going to perfect my diet. I started out as altering a few things in high school when I got into sports. Um, and it, my idea was to be the perfect athlete. And I didn't really buy into the media. I, I wasn't, I didn't pay attention to any media or anything like that. My story is quite different in that sense. Um, I didn't know what an eating disorder was. And in high school, I started changing a few things. And by my first year in, in college, I became a vegetarian, then I became a vegan. And over the years, it became more and more extreme. And then by a certain point, I got sucked into what I call a vortex. I, it suddenly became an eating disorder. And my, my idea of eating healthy and all about nutrition and, and being the perfect athlete didn't make any sense anymore. It had no logic anymore. I was living off of popcorn and jello, and I couldn't get out of it. And for many years, I didn't admit that I had a problem. It took my family. Um, they, they forced me into treatment. Back in 2000, I went to Rogers Memorial. I was there for seven months. Uh, my parents paid out of pocket. And that was a big investment. Um, and within two weeks of being out of treatment, I was back into my disease. And my family said, we're done with you. Um, I didn't talk to my family for almost two years. And in, in that process of being in the hospital, I got on Medi-Cal, which is disability in California. And a couple years after that experience, I really realized I had a problem and it was going to kill me because I started having medical complications. So in 2004, I started seeking help. And I didn't get help until the Dr. Oz show in 2009. Um, and I ended up staying in Rosewood for, I was inpatient for five and a half months. Um, I did the partial program for four and a half months. And then I was in the IOP house for almost 11 months. So one thing I did, um, towards the end of my stay, I started going back up to the inpatient and partial levels of care and interacting with my peers and trying to be supportive. Um, and one thing I really stressed with every, everybody I talked to was to stay as long as possible. And I, I still look back on my experience, and I was ready to leave after th three months there. I thought, oh, I'm done. This is great. I'm, I'm ready to be out of here. So I can totally understand that, that idea that you want to leave. Even though I really needed to be there, in my mind, I thought I was doing better. So one thing I've noticed, um, I actually went to Rosewood about, it would be two years ago, February. So it's been about two years, six months. Um, and with most of my peers, the attrition rate is incredible. I can't, t I, uh, I can't count on my hand how many of my peers are in recovery. And I also often get asked, you know, what, what made the difference? 
And I don't really have a good answer other than the fact that I know that my eating disorder means, meant for, what it meant for me was death. Um, and I really wanted it with every fiber in my body. And secondly, um, I had the gift of a really long stay. I got to stay as long as, it, as I needed to stay. And so when I talk to my peers, I, you know, I, I, I want to instill in them that desire to get better, but you can't do that. They've got to want it themselves. But what I try to do is try to instill within the, a sense of hope that it really is possible to recover. Because I spent so many years believing that I had a terminal disease. I couldn't get better. I never imagined I'd be where I'm at today. Um, a buddy of mine who came along to this conference, we play volleyball on, I live in Laguna Beach. And I'm down there on the courts playing beach volleyball, which I hadn't done since I was a teenager. But I really thought my life was over before I went into treatment. I didn't think, <laughs> I, I, I really didn't think recovery was possible. So I can really get, when I talk to people, they can't see that light. They, don't, they can't even imagine it because that prison that we're trapped in, there's, there's no way out. And people go into treatment and they, they, they relapse and then they go into treatment again, they relapse and they lose hope. So anyway, um, I guess we can go into the interview part since we're probably short on time. Do you guys have any questions that we can address first? So um, early on you were talking about some of the differences between, you know, men want to be <coughs> I can't speak a lot to that. I'm not a you know expert on that area, but um, it just seems that the people who have had eating disorders that I have known growing up, whether it's as uh, going through treatment or who I've had as clients, um, many of them have been athletes, but there's a obsessive with being thin. There's something about being thin that is somehow popular, really cool. And it's just such a trend because back in the 30s and 40s, back in the World War areas, when women went to work, and there was this, you know, that that striving to be thin wasn't there, you know. So it's an interesting study. I don't know exactly why that is. But. Yes. I have two questions. Um, one is, you know, Brian, you mentioned earlier to me that you had some negative experiences with the 12-step. I did. And I think this being an addiction conference, and given the earlier my talk about addiction and the eating disorders, could you comment on that? Sure, definitely. Uh, you know, your experience and how an addiction and 12 step approach can be harmful? That's my first question. And my second question is how important it was, was it to you to have other men with eating disorders in the treatment program that you would have? I know Rogers is touted as being one of the few places. Sure. Um, during, during that process of trying to get help, my parents finally realized, I mean, for many years they, they had the attitude that, you know, I was choosing to do this. I simply needed to change my behavior. And they took the tough love approach and it really didn't work with me. I just got sicker and sicker. Um, when they finally realized I had a hospital stay where I had, I had a lung infection, I was in the hospital, uh, they thought I had tuberculosis. My, my immune system was non-existent. I had a white count of 0.9. Um, but after that hospital stay, they realized if I didn't get help, I was probably going to die. And I had several doctors say that. So they found this place in Florida called Milestones for Recovery. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. But it's an OA-based program. As an anorexic, I, I went into the program the first week. I thought, wow, this is great. I get to have sugar-free stuff. They don't let me eat sugar. I can eat rice cakes and fish and vegetables. I mean, it's everything I ate in my eating disorder. Um, but then after the first week of seeing, oh, this isn't really going to help me. I'm, I'm, I'm not getting anywhere with this. Then I started to resist the program. Um, but I do remember one we, part of the program was to go to the grocery store. And we had to find um, food without sugar in it. And you mentioned that it's hard to find. Well, it's impossible to find. Uh, you know, I used to be a health, I, I was totally into health, I read labels and figure out what's in your food. I went to the, the grocery store on the outing and I broke down in tears because I couldn't find turkey that didn't have sugar in it. 
Um, and as an anorexic, it just expanded the program tenfold. I, I, I was actually asked to leave the program. The director told me I was a pathological liar and I wasn't really sick. And I was 80 pounds. Um, it wasn't the 12 steps. I, I, I didn't have the bad experience with 12 steps. 12 steps was used in Rosewood, which I found to be helpful as part of the program. But it was the OA base, the idea that I was addicted to sugar. Um, and I wasn't making any progress. Two weeks into it, they decided to put me on supplement after two weeks of convincing me I was allergic to sugar or addicted to sugar. And I looked at the label and the first ingredient is sugar. I said, well, why are you doing this? Well, you're, you're an exception. You're not really allergic to sugar. So I, as an anorex, I, I, you know, when my peers go to OA meetings, I always think, oh, gosh, you're going to do that. I know they're different in different states, but where I was at, it, it was pretty hardcore on you know, that concept that we, we are addicted to a food. My own experience with Rosewood, I, and that, I also went to Rogers, and at Rogers I was able to be, my, how, how many people have heard of orthorexia? It's the idea, that, um, the unhealthy obsession with quote unquote healthy food, because that's what, essentially what I did. I ate like a, my idea was to eat like a Bushman. Nothing processed, all organic. Um, so when I went to Rogers, I was kind of able to pick healthy things there. When I went to Rosewood, I had to eat everything. I'd eat Fruit Loops for breakfast, um, everything. And it was such a freedom for me to realize that I could eat everything and it was okay. So the idea that there's no restricting of anything, that was the best approach for me as an anorexic. I think that when you look at a treatment program for an individual, you really have to look at what they're dealing with. Because the idea that I'm addicted to sugar, that would be a big red flag for me. I mean, I'd, I'd love to go with that because I still avoid sugar. So. Oh, as far as males, um, again, as Gary was saying, there's a lot of shame in this disease, and it took me a lot of years to overcome that. Obviously, I went on national television. I've been on national television three times now. Um, I don't even think second about the fact that I'm a male and having a eating disorder. In fact, when I meet people and I tell them, um, as far as being in the treatment, um, I, I went to treatment specifically with males at Rogers uh, 11 years ago. When I went to um, Rosewood, I was mixed with the entire population. And I didn't really feel that, I mean, there were males there, but oftentimes, I mean, I had to live with eight women at one point, which actually was kind of crazy making. Um, I mean, it sounds like the, guy, the guy's best dream, but it was a nightmare. <laughs> um, but being in treatment with women, <laughs> What's that? Um, well, women are really dirty, for one. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't even want to walk into their bathroom. It was boring. <laughs> um, no, they're just really intense. There, there's intensity in it. I guess when a guy came in, it, it, it kind of broke up that there's a lot of drama. Um, I, I, mostly at women in this room, so I don't think I want to go into that too much more. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's half funny to me, and I think it's kind of hard to see the difference. Right. Right. And I think it's a really important concept for us to be able to be learning about. You know, we, we yeah. have to be able to step back and say, yeah, we have a lot of drama, but here we're trying. Yeah. When, 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 when I was alone, that's what, when, when I felt it the most. When another guy came in, or there's two guys, it, 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 like the whole house relaxed. It, it was really weird the way the dynamics worked. Um, but as far as being in treatment like inpatient, it didn't really matter to me what sex it was. I, I felt free to talk about anything, um, and most of my peers trusted me to talk about anything as well. I mean, that's a special bond you make with people in treatment. One thing I did find difficult was when I first started looking for treatment is in fact, even here at the conference, I went into the conference room and um, talking to people from Orange County because I'm looking for work in Orange County. And well, we don't actually even treat males. And three people, three different places, they don't treat males. And that was one of the big 
uh, roadblocks we have when we're seeking treatment. So. Well, for me, I still struggle with shame-based thinking. Um, I don't have my eating disorder anymore. I, I like to say that I gave that up back in 1990. Um, my, la my last hospitalization was in December 15, 1989. And after that, I went through some outpatient treatment to, um, you know, to wean my way off meta three different medications and so on. But the thing that I continue to struggle with is probably the shame based thinking and some depression and things like that, OCD tendencies. Um, I don't want to go back to my eating disorder. I that is I have no interest in that. I what I was sharing with Brian before, I just got sick of being sick. Um, it wasn't meeting my needs anymore. It was just my therapy was just such a, a, a wonderful salvation for me. I mean the things that I learned even though I was so stubborn, um, so thick-headed, that you know, once I started experiencing the unconditional love and you know, people who I those psychiatric nurses were my <laughs> it wasn't the doctors for me, it was the psychiatric nurses that really took the time with me and. They got down in the muck with me, and they put up with me, and um, but you know, just so caring. You know, they they understood, they listened, and I didn't want people telling me what to do. <laughs> I wanted people to listen to me, and um, so I guess that shame still comes back with me. Um, that message is still there, but I have other uh, messages that I substitute for it that I latch on to. And that was a key for me. I had to put in that work, whether it's memorizing, you know, affirmations or Bible verses or whatever was meaningful for me. You know, put them on the mirror of my bathroom or put them on the front door of, or put it on the door of my room before going out. Put it on my, um, you know, steering wheel of my car. Although that's not recommended if you know you're driving, but. I mean, I had to do things like that to continue to pelt it through my head and say, "No, Gary, you're all right. You know, it's okay. You know, you're you're not this terrible person you think you are." And so I had to put in that work. And a lot of people come to therapy that I think they don't want to put in that, but they don't want to change. But it, it does pay off with the hard work and the patience. So, but shame-based thinking is probably the thing that I still struggle with. And you need to ask about a relationship with food. Um, let's see. I'm still early in recovery. Um, I still follow a meal plan. It's actually worked really well for me. I kind of looked at recovery, I, I, I compare it to a sport. And the reason I feel like I'm doing so well is because I had so many months to practice it with, with the support I had surrounding me. Um, one thing I've had to work on is rigidity around following the meal plan. You know, I, I've we talked about stubbornness, and I'm an extremely stubborn person. Um, but the flip side of stubbornness is perseverance. And so using that, I use that in my recovery. I use that perfectionism for recovery. Now I have to learn not to be so rigid with my recovery, and that's what I work on now. I still struggle with healthy foods. I still eat pretty healthily. Um, but I think, I, I used to describe my eating disorder as like living in this box. It got smaller and smaller and smaller over the years. Smaller by more rules, more more foods that I wouldn't eat. Um, and what recovery did for me is it expanded that box. I still feel like I sort of live in a box, but I can come out of the box now. I can go out to dinner and not even think about you know how it's prepared or anything, and just order it just the way it's supposed to come. Um, when I cook for myself, I tend I tend to eat you know what I consider healthier foods. But I can still go to my mom's and not have all that noise in my head. And I still do that. I mean, I use this example. A couple months ago, I had dinner at my mom's and um, she made meatloaf, mashed potatoes and cream corn. And the meatloaf was like an inch of oil. It was floating in. She put half a stick of butter in, in the cream corn, half a stick of butter in the potatoes. And my head is going crazy. 
I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm going to have to eat this? Because I'm in recovery and I'm, you know, everybody knows I'm doing great. Um, so I sat down and I, I, I actually didn't say anything about the food. And I, I ate the dinner and enjoy, I focused on the taste. I enjoyed it. And I, I did okay. But I still had all that noise in my head. So for me, it's still there. Um, I agree with Gary, though. For me, I think of my eating disorder, that means death for me. I, I, I was existing. I was surviving. Um, my life was hell. And I don't want to go back there. Um, that's one of the amazing things. Um, I had osteo moderate to marked osteoporosis about 11 years ago. That was early into the disease. Um, and I had a severe lung infection for three years. I was an on antibiotics for three and a half years. Um, I had a white count of 0.9, so my immune system was non-existent. I was on Neupogen every two weeks. My blood sugar, I, I, my blood sugar would bottom out, and they had me taking my blood sugar the last couple months, and it would average for like 28 to 30. And they said I should be in a coma. I mean, I was an absolute mess. And just this past six months, I've been seeing my doctor regularly, and my osteoporosis is gone. I have normal bone density. My immune system is back to normal. I have a white count of like five. Um, and I'm playing volleyball, and I'm doing all the things I thought I wouldn't do again. So I'm blessed to feel where, where I'm at. I'm feeling really good. Um, well, one of the things that I learned that is very helpful is not to focus so much on food and body type and comparison, comparing yourself to other people and other boys and, you know, this person is faster, this is more, this person is more muscular, you know, there's so much comparison going on and so much competition. Um, I always try to have parents to lay off that stuff, you know, to really focus on listening to their kids, just spending time with them, enjoying them, I'm encouraging them with the talents that they do have, um, encouraging them when they don't, you know, succeed at something or when they strike out three times in a game or when they, if they decide, you know what, I don't want to go for basketball this year. You know, not, instead of looking at them like, really? You know, just like, well, how come? You know, and try to be a little bit more sensitive to that. Um, you know, as, as guys, here in our societies, you know, we're kind of portrayed as, you know, we need to be tough and can't share our feelings and, and that kind of thing. Well, there's a lot of men out there who hate that stereotype, you know, me being one. You know, I don't like, that is not the typical guy, you know, I don't like that. I, it's okay to talk about feelings, you know, it's okay to... Um, talk about the elephant in the living room, so to speak, that everybody wants to avoid. If it's an eating disorder, if it's alcohol, if it's obsessive compulsive disorder, if it's depression, if it's self-injury, if it's fear of disappointing somebody, you know, to talk about it. Um, and listen, that's probably the best thing you can do. Yeah, it's, um, well, if they're an athlete, I, mean, I want to know whether or not, first of all, they even want to do athletics. Well, they do, let's say, let's say they do okay. the parents pushing them. Okay. 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 I can probably speak to that. Okay. Because that's where mine, that's, that's where the roots of mine were. Um, I was a soccer player and then high school came along and I went out for cross country. My coach was into nutrition. And so he said, well, you know, to be a good athlete, you have to eat right, too. And that's when I started making the changes in my diet. At that point, I had no idea what an eating disorder was. No idea. Never heard of it. So I think 
the key would really be to educate people about what eating disorders are. And if I would have known, I probably wouldn't have gone down that road. So. Do you want to add to that? Nope. Okay. <laughs> like that's really good. Other questions? Brian, I'll be hanging out here for a few minutes. Um, not intentionally. I mean, not yeah. But, but, you know, but of all the students on on the team, you know, how many developed anorexia? But you wouldn't be the first case, right? True. But I twisted it up. You know, I, 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 I took his idea and ran with it my own way. That's my perfectionist tendencies. My parents were going through a divorce at the time. It was, you know, we talked about control. It was my, my thing to control. Perfectionism was my way of dealing with it all. And when I applied it to nutrition, and his, his ideas are what I ran with. Back then? Yeah, back then? Oh, not at all, no. Yeah, I mean, I was changing, it was little things. I was like, you know, peanut butter and jelly became peanut butter and honey, then that was turkey sandwiches, you know. And then the 80s came along and they decided to stop eating fat. I didn't really get sick until I was about 27. I was still a very competitive athlete. I was, I was running at state level and, and so it didn't impact me that much. So my parents, they didn't, I think I was thin, and I can't tell you how many times people would say, why are you so thin? Well, you know, I run all the time, I'm a runner. I eat healthy. Kind of progressive. Very progressive, very slow. I had no goal for, for losing weight. I, it was unintentional. And it, it, like I said, it really just snuck up on me over the years. Totally agree. I don't think eating disorders were that widespread when I was that age. Um, I, I went to high school in 87, graduated in 87. Um, I think nowadays I would think it would be key for, for coaches to talk about eating disorders. I, I, my friend here, Kevin, his daughter just did a documentary um, on eating disorders in seventh grade. And I shared it with the alumni, Rose wrote the alumni, uh, we have an alumni page, and they were really touched, they were in tears, it was really powerful. Her peers made fun of it and pinned it up and they ended up taking it down. So it's, it's tricky at that age. I wouldn't want to blame it all on that. I mean, we talked about the perfect storm. Yeah, you talk, we, it's, it really is the perfect storm for eating disorder. My parents were going through a divorce at the time. I was the ping pong child back, back and forth between both parents. But even once yeah. it starts, they yeah. don't recognize it. Right. But I think education really is key. Because I was, I was a pretty bright kid. Had I known about what I was doing, maybe I wouldn't have gone down that road. I think our timer has finally come to an end. Thank you, everybody.